Hi, and welcome back to the RFM channel. My name is Mark Tucker, and I'm Director of Hardware Engineering for RFM. Today we want to talk about a particular kind of module that we make called a frequency hopping spread spectrum module. Sometimes you'll see these in the literature referred to as FHSS, or sometimes people just call them hoppers, and that's, the, that's what we do around here, for instance. Turns out the, the frequency hopping module is very useful because it does two things exceptionally well. It, it defeats multipath and also works very well against interference. Now these are two things that are the major contributors to link problems. Whenever you're trying to set up a wireless link, you're going to find that really probably the two biggest issues are going to be multipath related or due to interference. And it turns out the frequency hopper works very well against these things. So I thought what we would start off with is just a, just a brief introduction of how the frequency hopper works. It's, it's really quite simple. It's a concept that's been around since like 1942. The uh, actress Hedy Lamarr and, uh, has a patent on this from around that time. And uh, so it turns out that technology has been around since the Second World War and came into its own during the Cold War, basically, and during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And now it's really kind of in a lot of commercial products, including these modules we'll talk about today. So a frequency hopper does exactly what, this, what the name implies. It hops around on multiple frequencies. And the best way to really kind of vision that, envision that is to look at it just like this, whereas this is the amplitude and this is frequency. Whereas a standard old-fashioned radio or a Wi-Fi radio might just simply park on one channel and stay there, the frequency hopper works just in various copies of that. Tens, dozens, sometimes hundreds of channels, depending on the type of radio involved. So the idea with a frequency hopper is that you send data on multiple channels. You take full advantage of the frequency range that's allowed to you. You use what we call frequency diversity. And it's, it turns out to be a very powerful thing for sending data across the expanse. And the, the way our radios work in particular is, if you send a signal on one channel, for instance, say this one, and for whatever reason it doesn't get through, that's OK. Because the very next hop, which could be all the way over here, or way over here, or back down below, the same signal, the same data will go off on that channel. So the chances of two of these things being completely obliterated turns out is really very low. So in fact, you can transmit as many times, uh, I think up to 16, if, as you like, before the data actually can expire. So you can really get a very robust link by just simply trying and trying and trying again, taking advantage of this frequency diversity. So the frequency operator, like I say, does, does two things well. It works well against multipath and against an interference. So multipath is something that, that we spend a lot of time explaining to customers, and it's really pretty straightforward, as it turns out. The best way to imagine it is to say you've got a transmitter over here and a receiver over here. And so, let's say you're inside some large enclosure. Many times our customers are inside big industrial complexes. And let's say you've got a large, either a wall or maybe a rack of equipment, something between these two units. Well, radio mostly travels in straight lines. It can diffract around things too, but it mostly think of it as a straight line type of, uh, type of deal. So in this particular case, let's say the transmitter transmits to this receiver through basically two what we call rays. One hits this wall and bounces to the receiver. The other ray hits this wall and bounces to the receiver. Well, both rays combine at the end, and that's fine, unless one thing happens in particular. If the length of this path is related to the length of this patch so that the two incoming rays are out of phase with each other, if they destruct, then you can completely lose the signal here. One way to think about that is if that's ray one and that's ray two, so if R1 comes in at this angle, and this magnitude, and if R2 comes in at this angle and this magnitude, the two will completely cancel and you'll get absolutely nothing. The best example of this is if you ever sat in your car at an intersection listening to an old analog FM radio, and you pull into the intersection and all of a sudden the channel fades, and then you let off on the clutch or on the brake a little bit and slide back just a couple of inches, and all of a sudden it magically reappears. You just moved out of a multi-path fade. What happened was, you made one of these line widths or line lengths slightly longer. And so instead of the two deconstructively or destructively interfering, basically you lined them up so they didn't do that anymore. And so that's the best way to think of it. Now, as it turns out, there's another way to get out of this fade besides just physical movement. And that's called spatial diversity, by the way, and it's used in many, many types of radius. The other way is to simply, simply change the frequency of that signal so that whatever particular combination of wavelengths added up to do this at one frequency will not at another. So that's, that's how we get out of multipath phase with a hopping radio. Basically, if the data didn't get through on one hop, change the frequency, and that particular combination of events that caused those two things to 
cancel each other will not take place. The next hop will look like this, or maybe even this. Maybe they'll even add constructively. So that's what frequency hopping does. It basically moves around enough to move in and out of these fades. So that's, that's one advantage there. The other advantage is in against interference. Now, it turns out the radio world, the spectrum in general, is completely filled with all sorts of signals. Wi-Fi, cordless phones, cell phones, you name it, it's there. And this particular band we use, what they call ISM bands at 902.4, are pretty busy bands, so frequency hoppers work very well there. The way to think of it is like this. If there's an existing signal already out in the ether, like a Wi-Fi signal or something like that, the frequency hopper works, but it's a hit them where they ain't philosophy. Basically, it hops around. In fact, we can even design hop sets that work around specific frequencies. We use all these channels just around this already pre-existing spectrum. As it turns out, if you, if you don't know what that is, and the signal hops through the interference, well, that's okay, too, for two reasons. First of all, generally speaking, the hopper will have a higher power density. It will actually burn through, if you will, the interfering, interfering party, which in this case is like a Wi-Fi signal or something. But even if it can't do that, that's okay, because even if you transmit at the same time as the Wi-Fi signal, you know that even if that doesn't get through, next time it will. You'll transmit on this channel, or that channel, or this channel. Something will get through, and that's the whole key. So it turns out the hoppers work extremely well against this sort of interference. Even if it's moving around, they work much better than, uh, than any other technology. In fact, this is really why frequency hopping was invented. It was to do this very thing. It was to defeat these Soviet jammers and things of that nature from the Cold War. But it turns out it works extremely well in the commercial world, too, or in the industrial environment especially. So because it has this combination of, of multi-path immunity and ability to work with interference and work around interference, these are really kind of the key points in our frequency hopping radios and why they work so well for industrial environments.